everyone and welcome to Codenomicon 2018. Codenomicon was started several years ago as a way to uh, get the community together. It's a great way for us to interact as a community. It's a great way to come together, have some food, some drink, listen to some speakers, and to basically just communicate and get to know folks who are doing what you're doing, uh, to get ideas about how you can go back to your job and do that better. So welcome, we're glad you're here. It's a great view. Uh, it's a great venue and there's plenty of great food, so enjoy yourself while you're here. A couple of quick notes for you. You received a package on the way in, a welcome package, so welcome. Uh, inside your welcome package is a scratcher card. If you take that scratcher card and scratch off the, the spot, it will tell you about a fabulous free prize you have won. In order to pick that up, you have to come to booth 128, the synopsis booth on the floor, turn in your scratcher card and you will get your fabulous gift, okay? So everybody knows they got, there's more stuff for you. Just a quick note about the program. We'll be here uh, doing, program, uh, doing speakers from about six o'clock to nine o'clock and the party ends at 10. By then, hopefully the uh, sun will go down and we'll have an even more spectacular view of the strip, so it should be great. The restrooms, if you go past the bar, the restrooms are on the wall to the right. Even the restrooms here are trendy, okay? So it's, it's important that you visit them. I will tell you that it took me almost five minutes to turn the sinks on. There's two little dots by the spigot you have to put your hand close to to get the water to flow. So there's, that's a little public service to keep you from aggravation, okay? Um, the other thing we want you to know is that there's going to be a book signing uh, after our keynote presentation. Uh, Sarus is going to be over in the corner there with his books and be, they're available for sale. He will also, of course, sign them. You can speak to the author uh, after the presentation. I'm sure after you hear his presentation, you're going to want to grab his book. A couple of other announcements I'll make about other presentations and things I'll do as we uh, bring up other speakers along the line. Uh, it is really important that, um, you know, that Black Hat is such an interesting event and has become so large that you break down into groups like this where you can actually meet people, stop, and have some great conversations. And that's the whole purpose behind tonight. So uh, without further ado, I want to address, uh, excuse me, I want to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for tonight. Saruz Farivar is a senior tech policy reporter at Ars Technica and an author and radio producer. He just released his second book, which he's brought here, called Habeas Data, which is about the legal cases that have had an outsized impact on surveillance and privacy law in America. And he will be speaking about privacy tonight. In 2017, Sarus was a co-recipient of the Technology Reporting Award from the Society of Pro uh, Professional Journalists for a 2016 story in Stealing Bitcoins with Badges, How Silk Road's Dirty Cops Got Caught. Okay. His first book, The Internet of Elsewhere, talks about the internet in, uh, in third world countries and other far off places and how those interact. So without further ado, let me introduce Saris Faribar. Hey, what's going on? How you guys doing? Um, so yeah, thank you, uh, Synopsis. Thank you guys for spending a little bit of your uh, week here with me. Uh, I just flew in from Oakland, and boy, are my arms tired. Uh, I've always wanted to say that dumb joke on stage. Um, this feels like an open mic type situation. But um, thanks again for coming. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here at Black Hat. I've never come to Black Hat before. Um, I, um, I, uh, you know, I normally don't report a lot on security stuff. Most of what I report on is uh, privacy and surveillance. Um, day to day, I'm a reporter for Ars Technica. How many Ars Technica readers in the house? All right, thank you guys for reading. If you're unfamiliar with Ars Technica, it is a tech news publication um, published by Condé Nast. We're a sister publication of Wired Magazine and The New Yorker. Uh, I write a lot about surveillance and privacy. I have colleagues who are here in Las Vegas this week who write a lot about digital security. Uh, Sean Gallagher and Dan Gooden. If you find them, tell them I said hi. Uh, they're very nice people. I wanted to start off um, my talk tonight um, by trying to kind of impart to all of you who are out there in the field, in the trenches, uh, helping us, you know, protect our networks and our devices from, you know, the miscreants of the world. Uh, I wanted to 
and the PR people in the room might not want me to say this, but I, I really urge you to come find friendly journalists that are out here. I'm here, I think there's some other journalists here in the room, uh, you know, was mentioned earlier that I won that award about the dirty cops that, that uh, you know, uh, busted the, the, the SoCard guys and stuff. We as journalists rely on all of you to tell us stories, okay? That's really what we're here to do. Um, I know because I've dealt with a number of tech companies, sometimes it's hard because you have to get clearance or whatever, we have to go through your PR people, I get that. But figure out a way, find somebody whose journalism that you trust, whether it's me or anybody else, um, to tell interesting stories, interesting trends, interesting things that you would have a conversation at a conference like this. Tell us, that's how we learn about them. So I just implore you uh, to think about that as you go uh, you know, out from, from tonight. Uh, that's, how, that's how we learn things, is by people tipping us off. So my book tonight, um, Habeas Data, as was said, it focuses on 10 mostly Supreme Court cases um, I try to tell the story, uh, sto the legal stories, as they evolved from 1967 to the present day. I look at uh, a Supreme Court case um, that goes way back to 1967 called Katz versus United States to another one that was just decided in the Supreme Court of just a few months ago called Carpenter uh, versus United States. Um, and I cover, as I said, as was said a moment ago, 10 cases that really have had an outsized impact on the intersection between technology and the law and privacy and surveillance and how all of those things uh, kind of, you know, work with each other or sometimes don't. Um, and so I hope that, uh, you know, if you do decide that you want to read the book, uh, I think it's pretty good, um, that, uh, you know, that's kind of what you're in for. So I wanted to start off tonight by reading a little bit from the book just so you can get a flavor for what it's like. Um, and I wanted to read from another conference that maybe a couple of you have heard of a uh, little conference down the way known as DEF CON. Um, I wasn't sure, having never been here, I wasn't sure if it was kind of a Montague's Capulets kind of thing with DEF CON and Black Hat. So people, somebody told me before the show that if I mentioned the word DEF CON, I was not going to get thrown, you know, tomatoes at me or whatever. So uh, thank you for not throwing tomatoes at me. Um, so anyway, this uh, portion of the book, this is chapter four. Uh, the, the, the title of the chapter is called When Big Brother Rides in the Back Seat. And this, this um, little anecdote that I'm going to start off with uh, talks about the implications of a technology called license plate readers. How many people are familiar with license plate readers? Raise your hand. All right, more people than I normally speak to, so that's awesome. Um, so license plate readers, as you may know, uh, are a technology that are in common use by law enforcement agencies all over the country, right? They are little rectangles that are often mounted on the fronts of police cars. Uh, sometimes they're mount mounted uh, as a stationary scanning device. Uh, they can scan at incredible speeds, up to, up to 60 plates per second. Uh, there's a number of companies that sell, th that sell these types of devices, uh, and they're in use in cities big and small. My home city of Oakland, California, uh, uses them. More than 30 Oakland police cars, as I speak, are using them right now. Um, if you know anything about the Bay Area, you might know that there's a tiny city that is geographically surrounded by Oakland uh, that's called Piedmont, California. It's about 12,000 people. It's mostly a residential neighborhood, very well to do. Uh, the good people of, Pied of Piedmont, in their infinite wisdom, because they don't trust, you know, the riffraff from Oakland like me, uh, they have mounted license plate readers at most of the border points between Oakland and Piedmont. So if you drive through Piedmont, you're going to get your car scanned. Um, when police use these types of scanners, as again, as some of you may already know, uh, the police are using these scanners to compare an unknown plate against a known plate, right? So they have what they call a hot list. Uh, they're, they're using uh, wanted cars, stolen cars, amber alerts, things like that to scan the unknown plate against the known plate. They flag the officer and then it's up to the police officer to determine whether or not uh, he or she should pull over the car or effectuate an arrest or, or do whatever they need to do. Um, the overwhelming majority of data that is collected by these license plate readers is innocuous. In my home city of Oakland, uh, the hit rate, that is to say the number of matches from the unknown plate against the known list of, of suspicious cars, uh, the hit rate in Oakland is 0.2%. In all of my research, I have never encountered a hit rate higher than 1%. So the overwhelming majority of this type of data is of just regular law-abiding citizens like me who were just interested in, you know, going about their business, uh, eating tacos, drinking beer, going to baseball games. I assume everybody does that. Uh, that's what I do. Um, so anyway, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of, of license plate readers and um, give you a kind of a flavor of, of how this book is, is sort of structured. July 27th, 2012, Las Vegas, Nevada. 
At one of the world's most well-known hacker conferences, DEF CON, Mike Katzlikabe did not stand out, even if he did sit in the front row. As a middle-aged man with a protruding belly, a formidable salt and pepper beard, and a friendly smile, Katzlikabe was seated wearing a black t-shirt, the de facto DEF CON uniform, of course, amidst hundreds of fellow conference attendees. Like these other digital security professionals, he was there to learn about all the new scary ways that devices could be threatened and how to fight back. He was a regular, having attended DEF CON for over a decade. The 45-year-old was attending a talk given by two ACLU lawyers and two technologists. Can you track me now? Government and corporate surveillance of mobile geolocation data. This is 2012, remember. Quote, we are in a constitutional moment for location tracking, ACLU lawyer Ben Wisner said at the beginning of the talk. Less than a year later, Wisner became Edward Snowden's lawyer. Quote, this year, the unanimous Supreme Court held that when the police put a GPS device on a car and track a driver's location over a prolonged period, that is a search under the Fourth Amendment. That is, that is a search validated with a warrant. Quote, they never held that before, but we all know that the police probably do that thousands of times per year. Over the course of about 100 minutes, the four-person panel outlined the myriad ways that location information can be obtained through mobile phone tracking and how law enforcement can legally access that data. But the panel only briefly addressed other ways that someone's location could be tracked or monitored, such as the license plate on a car. When the panel was over and the room began to empty out, Katz Lakabe made a beeline for Catherine Crump, one of the ACLU attorneys. As an experienced ACLU attorney, she was used to people approaching her with cockamamie theories about government surveillance. She'd even stopped answering her phone at her lower Manhattan office because she would otherwise be tied up with people who had a, quote, wild theory about the microchip implanted in their head. But Katz Lakabe was different. Quote, I know all about license plate readers, and in fact, I have this photograph of me in my driveway getting out of my own car, he told her, explaining that he had gotten an entire cache via a public records request, and he promised to send it to her that day. Standing next to Katz Lakabe was Jennifer Valentino DeVries, then a reporter with the Wall Street Journal, and she immediately asked him for an interview, and he was happy to oblige. Quote, he struck me as an old school California nerd, she told me, recalling the first time they met. It's a particular type of nerd. You don't necessarily find them all the time. He had this combination of a little bit of paranoia that comes from knowing what the technology can do, but he was not one of the hardcore DEF CON hackers. He's an old school guy. He brought his daughter to DEF CON. He seemed like a sweet, reasonable person. But what sold her on Katz Lakabe was the fact that he had the wherewithal to file a public records request about himself. He had actual evidence of it happening to him personally, she said. What had happened to Katzlikabe was happening to millions of Americans nationwide, almost entirely without their knowing. The government was not only collecting data on who people were calling and when, but also recording where people were driving, often for years on end. So what provides the legal authority for law enforcement to routinely collect so much data? Proponents argue that a 1983 Supreme Court decision, United States versus Knotts, which found that there was no reasonable expectation of privacy in public means that it's okay for officers to observe a license plate in public. Even though this ruling was made at least a decade before LPR, license plate readers, went mainstream, the practical effect is that everyone's license plate can be scanned and retained forever. So I don't know if you guys uh, have ever filed a public records request. I always say this to people. It's very, very easy to do. Uh, you don't need special powers. You don't need to be a journalist. You don't need to be a lawyer to do this. If you don't know if your own city or your own sheriff's department or whatever law enforcement agency you're interested in has a license plate reader or a drone or a body camera or all kinds of other crazy surveillance kit that's out there you guys probably know better than I do, if you don't know what's actually on use on our streets, I would urge you, go home tonight, file a public records request, send an email, some of them require to send you a fax for, send a fax for some strange reason. Uh, but you know, every agency, every state um, has a public records law. Anybody can do this, it's very easy. And that is what made Katz Lakabe's story so compelling, was that not only had he asked about how license plate readers are, u license plate readers are used, but he asked his own home city, San Leandro, California, right next to Oakland, to show not only what the data was that they had, not only where he'd been scanned, but to provide the actual photographs of his car. 
Um, because he spoke with that reporter at the Wall Street Journal, a few months later, there was a front page story in the Wall Street Journal about license plate readers. And that story was incidentally the first time that members of the city council of San Leandro had ever heard of license plate readers. Because he met a reporter in this city, and even though the city had been using license plate readers for five years, the city council did not know about it. Okay? So again, that's why I say to you up top, please tell us there's a lot of things that we don't know. Uh, so, you know, I urge you, please find a friendly journalist uh, to, you know, inform us of, of what's going on in, in your part of the world. Um, because of people like Mike Katz-Lakabe, uh, I have been inspired to file my own public records requests uh, about how license plate readers are used uh, in my home state of California. Um, I have filed records requests asking for data about myself in my, in my hometown of Santa Monica, California, down south by LA. Uh, by the city of LA, the county of LA, uh, the CHP, uh, Oakland, California, Berkeley, San Francisco, San Mateo County, a number of cities and counties all over California. Um, I obtained a number of records. Uh, the city of Oakland was actually pretty responsive. They sent me, you know, 20 odd, um, 20 -odd records uh, showing that I had, you know, been at a particular place at a particular time. Uh, the city of Santa Monica was the only city that required that I prove that I owned the car that I claimed to own. They required that I show them my registration. Other cities did not require that for whatever reason. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. I wrote a story about all of that uh, a couple of years ago when I first kind of fell down this privacy rabbit hole and especially the kind of LPR side rabbit hole. Um, and I took it one step further after talking to some lawyers and some local privacy activists. And I wanted to know, somebody said, well, why don't you just ask Oakland for the entire database of all of the license plate readers that they have ever collected. So I did that. So I filed a public records request with Oakland. Oakland, to their credit, uh, I'm about to run into this. Um, to their credit, Oakland came back with 4.6 million license plates. What that looks like is 20 spreadsheets with hundreds of, of thousands of lines each of an unredacted license plate, a GPS location, a date and a time. And they sent me 20 of these. Um, that gave me, if you can imagine having that much data at your fingertips, uh, which I'm sure you can, it gave me w what felt to me like a pretty creepy superpower. I could literally take any plate that I saw on the streets of Oakland, my own, my neighbors, my friends, uh, and punch it in to uh, our little tool that, that we had created, uh, which allowed us to plot where those plates had been seen on a map. And this is what the city of Oakland, unbeknownst to most of its citizens, still now, I think, unbeknownst to most of its citizens, could see where people had traveled. And, if, and as I did, I went and interviewed various officials from the Oakland Police Department, and I said, hey, uh, you know, what is this? How, how could you do this? Like, isn't this tracking? Like, what's going on here? And they said, no, 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 this is not tracking. This is not surveillance. We just know that you were seen here on this day and here on this other day. It's totally different. We're not, like, putting a GPS tracker on you. It's totally fine. And the legal precedent that they cited was this case that I write about in more detail, this case, Knotts. How many of you guys watched the TV show Breaking Bad? Or the new, I guess, the new spinoff, Better Call Saul? Okay, so if you're familiar with the Breaking Bad universe, right, you know there's like a meth gang, there's like the Walter White character, there's the Gus Fring character, right? The story of Knotts, as I describe in the book, in chapter four, the story of Knotts is Breaking Bad in Minnesota in the 1970s. That's basically what it is. There's like a, a guy who's down on his luck, who needs money, he's the chemist, he's the Walter White character. There's the kind of Gus Fring type character who's the like distributor dude. Uh, and they all decide that they want to go make meth together, and so they set up a lab in a couple of houses around the Twin Cities. Uh, this is the 1970s. Eventually, uh, after sort of getting chased out of town, law enforcement's kind of onto them. They decide that, it's, that they need to move out of town, and in fact, out of state. They need to move to, um, one of them, Leroy Knotts, has a cabin in a place called Shell Lake, Wisconsin, which is about 100 miles away. So when the police uh, start surveilling them and they realize that they're gonna be moving out of town, they put what is described in the court papers as a beeper, a short range FM transmitter. They put this on a chemical drum uh, of chloroform, actually. I've never tried to make meth, but apparently you need chloroform to make meth, or at least there's one way that you can do it. Um, so they take this drum, the police surreptitiously, without a warrant, 
put this radio transmitter on the, on the thing. Um, if you've ever looked at court documents, you know that oftentimes they don't come with pictures. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of the, of the actual drum or of the actual beeper. Uh, what I imagine the police had, because this is like mid to late 1970s technology, is they probably had some sort of like, you know, green and black little tiny screen. It was probably, you know, yay big. Uh, and it emitted, I imagine, one of those little like radar, like blinking light deals, right? So they're, they're literally just tracking these guys and the signal that this radio thing is giving off. Eventually, they, they, they lose the signal. Uh, they have to call in a helicopter at one point as they're traveling down the highway toward Wisconsin. Eventually, they do reach the cabin. Um, the police stake it out for a few days. They get a warrant to search the cabin. They find that, yes, they have a secret drug lab, and yes, it's behind a cool secret wall because drug lords need you know, secret walls or whatever to make meth. Um, and eventually, uh, the case gets, gets challenged, uh, United States versus Knots, and eventually, the case reaches the Supreme Court. And the question that the Supreme Court is, is faced with in the early 1980s, in 1982, actually, um, the year I was born, uh, is, is it, do, do the police need a warrant to track somebody in this way, right? To put this tracking device on somebody's car, do they need a warrant to do that? And as I mentioned a moment ago, I may have read it a little bit too fast, but, but you may have noticed, the answer that the Supreme Court came up with was no, that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you are in public. You don't expect that Nobody can see you when you're driving down the street, when you're walking down the street, when you're just going about your business. Anybody can see you. The police conceivably could have put a thousand officers lining down the highway and they could have seen with their own eyes uh, what these guys were doing. So the Supreme Court said, it's totally okay if you put a piece of technology, in this case a short range FM transmitter, to track somebody's location. Because of that, that is how we get to the situation in which we find ourselves today where we have this amazing technology called license plate readers that can scan far, far faster than humans can scan, right? I mentioned they scan up to 60 plates per second. That's an incredible speed. I usually don't speak to groups as big as this, but I often say to people, you know, all of us put together, if we went outside, we probably couldn't do 60 plates per second. With everyone in this room, we might actually be able to get to 60 plates per second. But that's like really fast, if you think about it, right? That's, that's, that's really incredible. So, you know, that's what I really try to do in this book, is to kind of tell the intersection on kind of a human scale, right? I mentioned this guy, Mike Katzlikabe, right? He's just a guy, he's a local activist, he was on the school board for a while, he's a security professional like you, uh, and he's sort of taken it upon himself to file records request after records request after records request as a way to better understand the myriad of technologies that are in use, in particular in the Bay Area. But these are not unique to the Bay Area. I would bet you that in the cities and counties where you live today, I would bet you that license plate readers uh, amongst many other technologies, are actively in use, you know, as we speak. Um, so it's really, I think, important, you know, on all of us to to better understand that. I think that oftentimes courts don't always really understand what the ramifications are of their, uh, you know, of their of what the law is and what the what the kind of technological reality is uh, in that respect. Right? I think that most courts do not deal with the fact that these technologies, license plate readers can scan up to 60 plates per second. I think most courts have not yet dealt with the fact that most uh, cities in America, I know here in Las Vegas, in Oakland, probably where you live too, uh, most police officers in the United States now have body cameras, right? It's going to happen incredibly soon, if it's not happening already, that those body cameras uh, are gonna have facial recognition capabilities, right? Um, if you've been following the news at all, you know that facial recognition is already in use in China. It's in use a little bit here in the United States. I'm not yet aware, maybe somebody can correct me, I'm not yet aware of a police agency using it on body cameras, but that to me seems inevitable. And if the police argue, as they have for a number of years, that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy, that the police can capture your license plate in public willy-nilly as you drive down the street, regardless of whether you're just, you know, like me, uh, you know, going to get tacos or whatever, um, then it seems to me that there's a strong legal argument that would say that you can also in the same way capture somebody's face. And just as there is a record of people's license plates that they own, right, if you own a car, the, the DMV or whatever it's called in your state, uh, you know, has a record that, you know, plate X belongs to this person, in the same way, if you have a driver's license, if you have a passport, right, the police already have, the government already has a really good, uh, you know, high quality image uh, of your face, uh, and my face too, uh, to, you know, against which to compare. So, 
you know, I think that without adequate legislation at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, um, we run the risk of essentially rampant, even more rampant than we already have now, uh, surveillance, you know? And I say this not to be anti-government and not to be anti-law enforcement. Uh, I think maybe a lot of us, if you work in, in security, I know it's common for a lot of people to be uh, cautious of, of government power, you know? Uh, and I totally understand that, right? If you look at what our Constitution says, uh, right, if you think about the different amendments, right, the First Amendment protects freedom of the speech, it talks about how Congress shall pass, how shall make no law, abridging freedom of the press, and so on and so on. Uh, the Second Amendment, of course, uh, you know, for the purposes of a well-regulated militia, uh, Congress shall make no law abridging, or, uh, uh, protecting the right to, to bear arms, and so forth. A lot of people forget about the Third Amendment. Uh, anybody remember what the Third Amendment is? All right, quartering soldiers, I heard in the back. Yeah, quartering soldiers, the government cannot quarter soldiers in your house, right? This, is a, this was a very big deal amongst uh, colonial Americans, our forebearers, right? You can imagine if the government could just willy-nilly stick a police officer or a soldier uh, or any agent of the government, uh, you know, in the tiny house in your backyard, uh, you might not like that very much. Um, Fourth Amendment, of course, protects us against unreasonable searches and seizures. All of these amendments, if you look at them, they're putting sort of the brakes on the government's power, right? So we have a tradition in this country of being very skeptical of, of government power. And one of the things, you know, and so I understand that in cities where there are very serious crimes, right? I live in a city, Oakland, California, where unfortunately, uh, on average, going back several years now, there have been something like 80 people murdered per year. Uh, as we all know, not very far away from where we're sitting right now, uh, last year there was this terrible shooting here in Las Vegas. Uh, you know, I think we all want uh, the police to use the tools that they have to go after people who are committing heinous crimes, murders, uh, you know, mass murders, and, and various other things too. I think we can all agree on that. But at the same time, I think we all don't want those tools to be used against us to capture information willy-nilly without any real meaningful restrictions on how that data is collected, how these tools are used, whether they're body cameras, facial recognition, license readers, drones, DNA scans, crazy things that we can't even imagine yet. Uh, I think, you know, some of us at least uh, are a little bit concerned about that. So one of the ways, the, the kind of, not to spoil the ending of my own book, but the, um, there is a little bit of silver lining in this kind of, you know, dark and stormy cloud. Uh, and the reason why I tell people to find out what kinds of technology is in your own communities is because that is the first step, I would say, in helping your cities, counties, states, hopefully Congress, if they can agree on what time of day it is, um, to pass meaningful oversight into how those technologies are used. In Oakland right now, there is an entity that sort of sits in parallel to the city council. It's called the Oakland Privacy Advisory Commission. As far as I know, it's the only city in America that has a body like this. It basically is a privacy watchdog for the city, right? So if the city itself wants to acquire, not buy, but acquire, any kind of technology that might impinge on people's privacy. And I use the word acquire specifically because oftentimes what happens is well-meaning police chiefs, you know, sheriff's departments will come before a city council or a board of supervisors and they'll say, hey, we just got this half a million dollar grant from the Department of Homeland Security, from the Department of Justice. Uh, can the city, can the county accept this free money? And the city councilors are like, yeah, cool, great, free money, that's awesome. And then that's it, that's the end of the story, typically. So now, um, so that has what has largely fueled the acquisition of things like license plate readers and some of these other types of technologies that I talk about in the book, is that most lawmakers are ignorant of the fact that these technologies are even in their own backyard. Remember our friend Mike Katzlikabe? It took five years, it took that reporter from the Wall Street Journal meeting Mike at DEF CON in 2012 before they even knew that they had them in their own city. And this is a small town. This is a town of like 100 odd thousand people, right? This isn't like some high profile, crazy big city where nobody knows what's going on, right? Um, so imagine in your own communities, uh, you know, do you think your council members, do you think your board of supervisors know the myriad, the laundry list of drones and other things that, that your law enforcement agencies have? I would bet the answer is no. And so, one of, so the Privacy Commission is a great step. So what the Privacy Commission does, and I urge other cities and counties and states to take a look at this, is when the Oakland Police comes, or any other city agency, it could be 
you know, garbage collection, it could be parking enforcement, it could be anything. Anytime they want to get a new piece of tech that could impinge people's privacy, they have to present it, they have to present an argument as to why they need it, they have to come up with a policy as to how it's going to be used, how it's not going to be used, how long they're going to keep the data, when they're going to delete it, what who has access to it. All these kinds of questions that, believe it or not, are not the norm typically when cities acquire this type of technology. So they make this argument. It's very public. It's very civil. I don't know about how, how city council meetings are where you live, but in Oakland, they can be very tense. They can go late into the night. Uh, people yell stuff. There are sometimes not super productive ways to you know, conduct public policy debates. Um, so this forum, the Privacy Commission, I think is a very good way to do that. Uh, there's eight commissioners representing all eight districts uh, across the city of Oakland. Uh, there's a liaison to the city. There's also a liaison to the police department. Those two liaisons don't vote, uh, but they provide valuable input into what the appropriate length of time is. For example, should how long should the license plate reader data be collected? Should it be kept for three months, for six months, for nine months, for a year? You know, what kind of policy should we have? And they can have a reasoned debate as to uh, what those limits should be. And I think that's really, really interesting. And I would be very excited to see that model be exported to other places. Um, another law that, ha that has come out at the city level, uh, which is similar to the, to the Privacy Commission, is again requiring public agencies to not only present affirmatively before they acquire drones or whatever else, whatever else they want, but also to come back every year and present a report to the city council itself and say, hey, we have 10 drones and we arrested 100 bad guys and we prosecuted 30 of them and we did X, Y, and Z things and we collected you know, 100 terabytes of data and we deleted it except for in this one case for these reasons and they present sort of a laundry list of things that they did. Which again is not the norm and that I find kind of incredible. You might as well that our cities, our public officials uh, that we entrust with our public safety do not do that. And so for now, you know, before I started writing about license plate readers in Oakland, I mentioned, you know, I collected 4.6 million records. Um, the city of Oakland had no policy as to how long they should keep this data. Effectively, that meant when they gave me those 4.6 million records, that was four or five years worth of data, uh, which I found sort of incredible. And when I looked at it, particularly at myself, I thought, what purpose does it serve? What law enforcement purpose does it serve that the city of Oakland knows that my car was parked in front of my favorite taco truck three and a half years ago? I've never been arrested. I've never been, I've barely been pulled over by the city, you know, for like running a stop sign or whatever. I'm not a high priority, I hope I'm not, for the Oakland Police Department. Um, and, you know, and I think it's one of those things where they just probably never thought about it. You know, I, probably some of you, uh, maybe most of you, uh, like me, you know, use services like Gmail, right? Cloud storage of email. You know, when I get email these days, I just like click archive because it's easier. And like, yeah, maybe in five years I might you know, there might be some reason why I need this message, right? I imagine it's the same for law enforcement, right? We live in a world now where storage is cheap. So, of course, unless somebody tells, tells you to specifically delete, unless your city has a policy that says you got to delete after six months, of course you're going to keep it. That, that, that seems like a no-brainer. Um, but until I started writing about it, the city of Oakland had no such policy. So, uh, again, I implore you to think about what is going on in your own cities uh, and your own communities. Um, you know, and I think that it's really important that we all start to sort of take stock uh, of these things. Um, Congress, unfortunately, I have not seen any real meaningful uh, debate or discussion about how these types of technologies are used. Um, one of the things that I think is also worth remembering is that we cannot rely on the court system to act as a meaningful check on the potential overreach of government, right? I mentioned these, you know, Supreme Court cases uh, that I write in, about in the book. Um, one of the things that I thought when I first started doing this kind of research was, you know, the Supreme Court and courts in general, you know, they're all a bunch of, you know, fuddy-duddies, uh, you know, these old people who don't understand technology, they don't understand how this works, and we're all just kind of hosed because, uh, you know, justice is in their hands. But what a, lot, what a lot of judges will say, especially conservative judges will say, look, it's not our job to make the law. It's our job to interpret the law, right? Uh, you hear this from a lot of, uh, of, of conservative judges especially, and that's true. And that's why passing meaningful local legislation to say affirmatively, this is what we want, this is how we want it to go forward, I think is really super important. Um, 
so I'll just give you a very quick rundown of some of the other cases that I talk about. I'm happy to take questions uh, for as long as people want to take questions. And I've been told that I should run off stage at 7 o'clock. And I'll be over there signing and selling books if you want to come and say hi and have a drink with me. Um, so the other cases that are in the book, I mentioned cats versus United States. Uh, this is chapter one. This phrase that I threw out earlier, reasonable expectation of privacy, it might be a phrase that some of you have heard before, but you might not totally know where it comes from. It comes from a really interesting case in Los Angeles, 1965, a guy who was interested in uh, illegal betting. He used to walk down Sunset Boulevard, he used to go to certain phone booths, make calls to his bookies on the East Coast, he would bet on college basketball games and so forth. Uh, the FBI and the LAPD didn't like that, uh, so they decided that they were going to put a microphone, and again, this is mid-1960s technology we're talking about, so they put like a pretty large microphone, and probably what I imagine is like a big, you know, reel-to-reel -reel tape up there. They put this on top of the phone booth. They had a guy watch him leave his apartment from a few blocks away. Somebody would scamper up this phone booth, press record as the guy would walk in, just before he would walk in to call his bookie, and again, the question was, did the government need a warrant to place the, the microphone, the recording device, on top, not inside, but on top of the phone booth in 1965? And that case is what created this phrase that maybe some of you are familiar with, this reasonable expectation of privacy. What that means is, just as you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your home, in your office, in your hotel room, in your taxi, in your Uber, your Lyft, I guess, uh, you expect, you don't expect the government to be surveilling you when you're in those most private spaces. And so they said, in a, in a telephone booth is the same thing. You don't expect to be surveilled by the government. And if they do want to surveil you, they need a really good reason to do it. They need a warrant. So that is where that phrase comes from. And so, but then, because, you know, our lawyer friends like to throw out all these kind of crazy scenarios, right, we get into other kind of weird situations like, do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you're walking down the street? As I mentioned with knots, the answer is no. Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you leave your trash out on the street for garbage collection? The answer is no. Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you transact with a third party, right, with, a, with another company? Uh, that creates another kind of weird situation, this third party doctrine. Um, the third party doctrine is another one of the cases that I, or is another one of the, the kind of legal, you know, outcomes that I talk about in a case called Smith versus Maryland, that case, the, the third party doctrine basically says, if I call you using, you know, Verizon cell phone network, the fact that I have called you on Verizon cell phone network means that we have involved a third party in this interaction. And I have relinquished my privacy interest in the fact that I have called you, right? Smith versus Maryland was this case that was decided in the mid 1970s that established this idea. It was that legal precedent that was the foundation for the NSA metadata program that Edward Snowden exposed in 2013. You might remember uh, this was the thing that you know, captured all of our phone records going for years, 2001 to 2015. Uh, and that program actually still continues to this day, albeit in a slightly different form. So um, I talk about uh, the whole Apple versus FBI debacle uh, that you may remember from a couple of years ago, what the law has to say about uh, encryption and forcing people to unlock their phones, things like that. Uh, I talk about license plate readers. I talk about stingrays, cell phone surveillance devices. These are fake cell phone towers uh, that the government uses to um, find people where they are. Uh, do, do those require a warrant? Uh, depends sort of which court you're at. Um, I talk about another case that involves GPS tracking, uh, United States versus Jones, a drug dealer in Washington, D.C. Uh, from roughly 10 years ago where the police put a, um, a physical tracker about the size of a deck of cards, a physical GPS tracker on the underside of his car, didn't have a warrant to do it. The Supreme Court said unanimously, nine to zero, no, you can't do that. Um, so, you know, it'll be really interesting to see how some of these cases move forward, uh, you know, as we move into the future when we deal with other kinds of, of potential uh, surveillance things, drones, body cameras, DNA scanning, uh, all of those kinds of things. Um, so anyway, that's what the book is about. It's for sale over there for 28 bucks, uh, 25 bucks cash. I take uh, Square, Venmo, PayPal, you know, all those things. Uh, anyway, I appreciate your time and your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Question right here. I've been told to repeat questions, so you can, or I can hand you the mic, either way. Oh, okay. Here. So you talk about facial recognition technologies becoming uh, much more widespread. Thanks. Thank you. Um, at the same time,
There's recently a bill introduced in Congress, and I'm not sure what its status is right now, to make it extra illegal for people to wear, cover their face while uh -huh. they're engaging in rioting activities. Antifa, yeah. it's the Anti-Antifa Act. Right. And then there's also people who are sort of, you know, politically allergic to people wearing burkas or face coverings or scarves or whatever like that. Do you see any, um, I don't know, I'm just looking to see if there are any points of connection between the kind of political aversion to people covering their faces in various ways and the state's interest in being able to use facial, facial recognition. Yeah, so I, I, for those of you who may, may not have heard, uh, I think the question was, you know, is there, what's the connection between people who uh, want to cover their face, whether for religious or political reasons or whatever else, versus a privacy interest? All right. <laughs> oh, it's me. Okay, we're back. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that bill, um, but, you know, I think courts have recognized uh, that there is a right to speak anonymously, whether in, in uh, you know, to, to protest anonymously, to be anonymous in public, um, to speak anonymously on the internet or in the media or, or other places. Um, uh, I think that it's an interesting quandary because you know, if your job is to be in law enforcement, you want to know who's who, right? You could understand if it's your job to go after bad guys, you could totally understand why a facial recognition body camera would be super useful to you. You could catch more bad guys. And it's the same thing that you hear from police officers who say, oh yeah, license plate readers are great, we catch a lot more stolen cars. And you know, okay, fine. If my car got stolen, I would want it to get it back too. Um, but I think that we all, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, balance between what power we allow the government to have and what rights we have as citizens, right? I think none of us want uh, a war to live in a world where in the name of public safety, uh, you know, the government has a video camera in all of our homes, right, or in all of our offices. Um, so I think that for a lot of us, that would be going too far, right? Uh, if you had to report, if you had to physically show up at a police station every so often, right? I think most of us would be upset about that. Uh, it's interesting because um, I talk about earlier in the book, I lived in Germany for two years, uh, between 2010 and 2012. And uh, if you've ever spent any time hanging out with Germans or living in Germany, uh, you might know that Germans have a particular uh, attitude towards, towards privacy. I think in a way that's a little bit different than how most of us, I think, in the U.S. have. Uh, a lot of us, I think, in the U.S., kind of have a default setting of being skeptical of government power and are generally speaking more accepting of, of the power of private companies. Uh, when, if you remember when Google Street View first came out, nobody thought twice in this country. Oh yeah, a private company can just drive down every street in America and take pictures of it and put them on the internet forever. Nobody cared. When I arrived in Germany in the spring of 2010, uh, a lot of people did care. Um, German officials cared a lot. Uh, this was a big news story for a number of months. Um, because in Germany, I feel like the default position is kind of the opposite. They're more trusting of their own government and less trusting of private companies. Uh, one of the things that I found out when I lived there that I found a little bit strange was that you have to, whether you're a foreigner like me or a you know, regular native-born German, if you're moving places of residence, you have to formally present yourself at the city hall and say, hi, I'm here, I'm moving from apartment A to apartment B or whatever, and I thought, Imagine if people had to do that in the US. I mean, the government already knows where you live anyway because you have a driver's license, you file taxes. But like, the idea that you'd have to like, physically show up, present your ID, I think for a lot of people, it would freak them out. Um, so that's a very long-winded way of saying, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't, you know it's, a, it's a really tricky balance um, between those two things. And you know, I, I, I don't know if that bill has passed or will pass. Um, but I think that if it did, in the name of public safety, I think that there would be some challenges from groups like the ACLU, Electronic Frontier Foundation, maybe others, to say, hey, yeah, people do have the right to wear, to be anonymous when they're, you know, making political protests. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, other questions? Anyone? Yeah, right here. So, hey, you, you mentioned that you live in Oakland, so I'm guessing you're familiar that California has instituted new laws that I believe go into effect in 2020 around data privacy. So I'm curious what implications you think that has and do you think that kind of addresses the space that you're talking about here? 
Yeah, so, so there's some new California privacy measures um, that are, I believe, going into effect. Um, of course, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the uh, similar measures or related measures in Europe, the GDPR. Um, so, you know, we all got those emails saying that your privacy policy had been updated and none of us read them. I know I didn't. Um, you know, I think these policies are very uh, interesting. Um, I think that California is in kind of a unique position because, number one, as you all well know, a lot of these tech companies are based in California. Uh, California is the largest state in the union by population, uh, so it kind of, you know, has more weight, right? If you want to do business in California, uh, which is quite a lot of people uh, compared to many other states, uh, you know, you have to abide by those rules. Um, California has been actually at the forefront of privacy laws in America. Um, in the way I mentioned this Katz case, right, this gambler guy at the phone booth in LA in the 60s, uh, a few years after that, uh, after that case happened, California uh, passed a, um, an amendment to its state constitution, to the California constitution, adding privacy as an affirmative right for Californians. If you actually go home tonight and you read, it's very long, don't read all of it, the California Constitution, it's in Article 1, Section 1, that Californians have an affirmative right to privacy. The word privacy, as you may know, does not appear in the United States Constitution, right? I don't think it's in any of the Federalist Papers. I don't think it's in the Declaration of Independence. I don't think it's in any of our founding documents. Uh, a lot of lawyers and judges, you know, as I mentioned, have sort of extrapolated a kind of privacy right, sort of, kind of. We have a we have a reasonable expectation of privacy, which is not quite the same as having a right to privacy. Um, so I hope that measures like is what's going on in California with respect to the actions of private companies, as you say, that, that bill that you're talking about, the GDPR in Europe, uh, other local laws that I was talking about a moment ago uh, with respect to what government can do, um, I'm hoping that that will be more meaningful uh, for all of us to have more uh, privacy protections. Um, I was talking with somebody earlier. One of the things that I find uh, most interesting about the GDPR, and I'm, I'm less familiar with the details, ironically, in, in the California bill, is that the GDPR, as you may know, imposes a uh, maximum penalty of, I think it's 4% of global revenue. So if you're Facebook or Google or some large company and you run afoul of the GDPR, uh, you're supposed to pay quite a lot of money uh, you know, to, a, to the European Union as a penalty for, for breaching people's privacy. Right now, there's not a lot of penalties for companies that get hacked or leak data or whatever. Uh, and you know, I think a lot of us, right, you know, maybe you get part of a get part of a class action lawsuit and maybe you get a check for $45, you know, six years later. Uh, and you know, that's fine. Uh, but you know, that's not that's not very much money. Um, you, in the wake of the recent Cambridge Analytica thing with Facebook, you guys might remember in the UK, Cambridge Analytica is a British company or was uh, before they went went bankrupt. Um, they got fined by the British Data, Data Protection Agency, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office. I think it was something like 150,000 pounds, which I'm sure is you know smaller than Mark Zuckerberg's you know annual lunch budget. Um, so uh, a lot of these penalties are not very meaningful. Uh, so I would like to see more laws like this um, that really uh, force companies who are maybe you know not acting as well as they should. Uh, so yeah, other questions. Last call for questions from me, not last call from the bar. Anyone? Okay. Uh, well, I, that about does it for me. Uh, I will be over there in the corner signing books. 28 bucks, 25 bucks cash, uh, take credit cards, etc. Uh, yeah, anyway, thank you very much. Have a great evening.
We're going to start the next phase of the presentation. We're going to talk about the future of application security, optimized security testing for DevOps with IAST. So I have with me today Amy DeMartin, who is a principal analyst serving security and risk professionals. And I'm going to be uh, asking Amy some carefully prepared, spontaneous questions uh, for her to answer. But before I do that, let me introduce Amy. Uh, in her previous role um, at Forrester, Amy served in infrastructure and operations professionals covering the strategy, design, organization, and implementation of modern service delivery, including continuous delivery, DevOps, and SecureOps, or DevSecOps, I guess it is now, when you combine all that, right? She has more than 20 years of experience. She started when she was 12 in product management, product and technical marketing, development and operations roles. Her previous experience includes positions at BMC and HP, where she was responsible for driving IT management software products from conception through the product life cycle. She, she has lived the life that all of you are living today uh, and has you know, done this in her past. She holds a master's degree in telecommunications and a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Colorado. Okay, cool welcome boss. Amy. Thank you. Okay. So. You don't, am I on? You're on. Oh, yay. All right, go Buffs. So thanks for being with us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and experience, uh, particularly at Forrester, both your experience with both security and ops? So when I started at Forrester five years ago, I started in the infrastructure and operations group, and I covered the ops part of DevOps. And as such, I started kind of leaking into security. Operations has a lot to do with security, especially when you start making environments consistent. It's a huge benefit to security. So I wrote the seven highly successful habits of rugged DevOps. So that was before DevSecOps was a thing. Um, we started calling it rugged DevOps. And I started talking about how to automate security testing in the software delivery lifecycle. And my RD, who was my current RD, who is in application security, did what he advises all people to do because, of course, there's not enough security people. He came and recruited me out of infrastructure and operations. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, we brought you here today to this beautiful venue to talk about interactive application security testing, or IAST. So, let's start by you telling us what IAST is. Okay, so IAST is an agent that gets installed on the web server, and it sits and it watches tests. And these tests could be a crawler that the IAST has, or it could be induced by other testing. Like if you've got Selenium tests, any kind of tests, an IAST agent will just sit and watch looking for security flaws. Okay, so we've just survived about 10 or 15 years of arguing between what's SAST and what's DAST, and now so we have IAS to add to that. Is, it a, is this something completely new? Is it a hybrid of SAST and DAST? Is it a little bit of both? How would you characterize that? So I don't, I don't really like thinking of it as a hybrid. Um, that kind of gives me heebie-jeebies. Really, it fulfills your dynamic testing. So I tell people that you really need to do static testing for proprietary code, you really need to do software composition analysis on open source, and then you really need to do some sort of dynamic testing. You need, for those, the pieces of code that, for example, are dynamically generated, the only way you're gonna be able to test it is with dynamic analysis. So I asked would fulfill that part of dynamic analysis, so it's closer to DAST. All right, that makes sense. So in the conversation with I asked, you also hear the term RASP. And then there's conversations about is uh, RASP will that um, replace WAF. So how do you compare all this to RASP and WAF? Right, and here's where it gets confusing because some vendors have an agent that will be I asked as well as RASP. A RASP tool really works in the runtime environment and its whole job is not only to see whether it's got security vulnerabilities or weaknesses, but then also to defend against those in a runtime environment. So that's the difference with RASP. Um, RASP and WAF are sort of duking it out at the moment. 
Um, RASP is really singing with organizations that have legacy applications that don't have a development team behind them, so they can't remediate the issues before it reaches runtime. And also those applications that are moving super fast, WAFs have no ability to keep up, machine learning or no, does not have the ability to keep up with fast moving apps. Okay, so a little subtlety that I've picked up is the difference is IaaS does not work in production, but RASP does. Exactly. Okay, got it. Okay, so how is it, you, you said it was more like DAS and different from the two, but how, how is it different then DAS and SAS, does it find different classes of vulnerabilities? Because when you explain DAS and SAS, there's always Venn diagrams and overlaps, and, and what does it find? So is IaaS meant to find something completely different? Um, and does it run in different phases of the SDLC? So IaaS can be moved into other locations. Um, because it can be induced by other testing, it actually has, in theory, a more complete view. So if you pair it with a crawler, it should work exactly like a DAST. But if you don't have it paired with a crawler, if you're using your Selenium test, in theory, it should have even a more complete view than DAST has today that it can give you pre-release. So it can tell you things like, hey, with this business logic, you've got a security flaw. Interesting. OK, great, thanks. So do you consider IaaS to be an alternative to DAST or a complementary technology? So my crystal ball tells me that eventually it will replace DAST. Now, we are very early stages. So most people are experimenting with IaaS today. That being said, um, it's on the same journey I see as performance monitoring was. So all those agents that you put out there to monitor the performance of your applications, also an agent. So developers want to know, what is this agent going to do to my code? Does it hinder performance? What is it looking at? What if the agent goes down? Will it kill my app? And so you're going to have to overcome all those objections that we just went through with application performance monitoring. So people can find a degree of solace in the performance or what they're going to see with IaaS by, by liking it back to what they've seen in performance management. Absolutely. That's, that's Same a, conversation. That's a very interesting point. So that should give people a good, a, a good benchmark for them to find the consideration, okay? Yep. So do you consider IaaS a new approach for testing software in certain scenarios? So I do think it's new in that because of the business logic testing, it's a more complete view. I think it's new because, um, in theory, if you've got test-driven development, you can actually move it way earlier in the life cycle. Um, you can actually move it to unit testing. So it is new. Is it the, is it part of the mythical shift left, then? It is part of the mythical wow, shift Wow, we're left. actually shifting left. That's fantastic. So let me, let's dive a little bit deeper into this, then. Can you explain how it works and in what kind of environments that it works? So it works because it sits on the web server. It's limited to languages. So languages that are common are things like .NET or Java. Um, and so that's really where it works the best. Um, because this is a very new market, look for it to support additional languages in the future. OK. So what? What are the, uh, when you step back from all that and how it works and the technology, what are the ultimate list of advantages that people should consider that if they want to start looking at IaaS and start getting it into their environment? So I know I said that it replaces eventually dynamic analysis. So when I talk to organizations, dynamic analysis always has kind of a bad taste in people's mouths, especially developers. Because what happens is a security pro has to get a machine or get a log into a test machine. They've got to run the dynamic test. They've got to correlate all the responses, make it pretty, give it to the developer. And the knee-jerk response of developers is, not on my machine. I don't see that issue. Because DAS naturally has this kind of input-output feedback, so it's not very believable. When you run IAST, on the other hand, and you can automate DAS to a certain extent in the software delivery lifecycle. But I asked, you just plop the agent down, you run your automated tests, you have the crawler if, you, if the product has it, 
And at the end of the day, the result comes with a stack trace. So now the developer can't knee jerk. They can't say this isn't my problem or this isn't in my code or I don't know where to fix this. You, you give them the information. That stack trace is golden. And so you eliminate that knee jerk. That knee jerk often results in someone in security going and doing a pen test and then producing the results and recording it and handing it off to a developer. All of that wasted time and it separates the developer from where they were developing code, where they were actually in the right headspace to fix the code. So if you can hand them a stack trace early in the life cycle, then you've eliminated all of that wasted time, security side as well as development side. So that sounds like it repositions security as actually a productivity tool because they're Absolutely. finding things very simple. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. We've heard you use the term believable when describing the results that IS tools provide to developers. Can you explain what you mean by that and why it's important? Right. So security needs to stop putting on the brakes in development. And we do it in all sorts of ways. Anytime we do anything manual, it's putting on the brakes. And by having things be completely automated, having the stack trace you can hand to developers, taking away that pen testing, all of those things speeds up development. Gives developers a way to give them kind of an extra fifth gear in their development car. And so that's really what makes it believable. That stack trace and the automated results is really what's gonna hand them the keys to faster release speeds. Great. So it sounds like it's good. It sounds like there's lots of advantages. It sounds like it can help speed up the process. What are some of the limitations of IS? Well, the biggest, of course, is language support. So if you've got COBOL or Fortran, IS is not for you. So um, you do have to look at what languages are being supported today, and then a roadmap for what's coming in the future. But the other thing is, and I've talked about that one of the benefits is you can have any test induced it. So if you've got Selenium tests, you know, you've got automated testing, then you can use that to drive business logic tests that your IAST can watch. Unfortunately, testing is also undergoing a transformation. So you may have some apps that have a lot of automated tests, and you may have some apps that have no automated tests. And that's why it's so important to have a crawler with your IAST, so that it will more, work more like DAST, and it'll work on more applications. What, what exactly does a crawler do to make that, uh, to activate the process? Right, so a crawler works exactly like a DAST would. It's going to enter your app and then crawl all normal parts and available options in your website. So in that way, the IS tool can fully see what the app is doing. Yep, but once again, if you've got the business logic to augment that, then you're starting to see flaws in business logic, which is awesome. Excellent, okay. So we see a lot of organizations today moving to more rapid and iterative development cadences with the emergence of CI/CD and DevOps. We couldn't do this without saying CI/CD and DevOps at least once, right? Can you explain why these trends are drivers for the adoption of IS technology? Right. So you've got an agent to install. You've got tests to kick off. You can automate reporting back to developers. All of those things just get easier when you're with DevOps. And so, because you've got the automation that you can hook into. So what is unique to IaaS that makes it such a good fit to integrate into the DevOps tool chain? So imagine a world, if you will, where everything has automated tests. I mean, that's what your testing group is driving towards. 100%, well, okay. As close to 100% coverage as possible with automated tests. So imagine a world where all your applications have automated testing. At that point, you don't need a crawler. At that point, all you need is your agent, and then you run the testing. That means there's zero dynamic testing in your software delivery lifecycle, zero. So if we move to that world, that's really where the CI-CD pipeline, the whole DevOps movement helps us is because we've got that automated testing and no additional testing for dynamic analysis. Okay. So it's a maturity process as we walk through this. And once again, an extra speed added to releases. More Excellent. productivity. Okay. So 
If I'm an organization looking to implement IAST, are there any prerequisites that I need to look at? Is there a certain maturity level that I need to be at before it will actually be effective for me? Uh, and whether I can adopt this into my DevOps and specifically get IAST to work and get the value out of it you've described? No, um, but once again, this is an early market. You know, if you've got any applications, if you're like most organizations, you've got some apps that are moving at DevOps speed and some that are not. And so focus on the ones that are using DevOps. It just makes it easier. All of that automation just makes the benefits of IAST clearer. And it makes it so much easier to install and run. So no, you could run it as a legacy app. As long as you've got a crawler, you could certainly run it for any maturity level. But the benefits are just a lot easier and clearer when they're more mature. So what advice would you give an organization who doesn't yet have that maturity? Start looking at it now. Um, my crystal ball tells me this is the future, so start experimenting, looking to see if you've got a product that's already got DevOps that you could start experimenting with IAST. Start today by talking to your developers and your operations people and actually include them when you're evaluating your tool set. So invite them into the conversation. Be clear about the fact that there is an agent. Start talking about the fact that we just went through this journey with performance. They had an agent, this is the same thing. We're gonna alleviate some of your concerns because we've just been through this. Start talking about the short-term benefits in terms of speeding up the release today, as well as what it would look like once you have all the full automated testing, how you, have, you go from, hey, we've got more beneficial dynamic testing, faster releases, faster speeds for development and for security, and then eventually zero dynamic testing long-term. All right, well, Amy, thank you very much. That was a great overview of IAST. I certainly learned a lot. Um, just a couple of quick notes for you. Uh, our own Ofer Mayor of Synopsys will be giving a session titled Modern AppSec for Modern Apps, Integrate IAST into your CI-CD platform. That will be Thursday, August 9th from 1.20 to 2.10 in Oceanside G. So Ofer will be doing a, a deep dive on IAST. He's uh, uh, very knowledgeable about IAST and will give you an even further view into the product set. Uh, we also have a, um, two of our senior security consultants will be presenting uh, at, a, at, um, at DEF CON. They're giving a presentation on enterprise blockchain. I'm only saying that because I, I can't go through an entire uh, security presentation without mentioning blockchain at least once. It's in the requisite. But that'll be Saturday at noon at track one. And the last thing I would remind you is that Synopsys just announced a new version of Seeker, which is our IS tool. That was announced on August 31st, excuse me, July 31st. And if you come by the Synopsys booth, we'll actually give you a demonstration of that tool so you can actually go and see how an IS tool works, see the type of results you'll get, and see how it actually uh, provides you the information we talked about. Amy, anything else you'd like to add before we close out? No, questions? Are we taking questions? Are we taking questions? We can take some questions if you'd like. Anybody have a question? I'm here. Obviously, you were very clear and very concise. Excellent. Very. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you soon for our panel, uh, panel session. Thank you.
Last session of the evening. Remember, this is not would mean that the party closes down. We close down tonight at 10. The sun is setting, so the view is getting even better by the moment. But I want to introduce our moderator for tonight's panel, Sammy Miguez, is principal scientist at Synopsys. He is the creator of our management consulting metrics and software security initiative offerings. He is also co-creator of the BSIM, the B Building Security and Maturity Model, a software security yardstick used to measure over 150 companies and their IT security. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Sammy Miguez. Thank you. And thank you. Um, our panel tonight is about privacy. I do not have a lot to say about that. So what I'm going to do is allow the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, Kim, would you start? Just, there's no button. Uh, no, there's no one? Okay. Uh, so I'm Kim Zetter. I'm a longtime reporter uh, covering cybersecurity privacy issues since 1999 uh, for PC World magazine first, and then a decade for Wired, and now I do freelance for New York Times, Washington Post, Politico, Motherboard. Oh, and I wrote a book. Uh, I'm Ben Ransford. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a, of a company called Verta Labs. Uh, hard to hear us. Okay, there we go. It's okay. We can't hear each other either. Uh, so I'm the uh, uh, co-founder and CEO of a company called Verta Labs. We're a startup, and we help uh, healthcare providers with uh, kind of basic cybersecurity hygiene stuff around risk management, patching, uh, vulnerability assessment, and so on. Um, and uh, my career in information security started uh, probably 20-something years ago, but I started uh, kind of making a splash about 10 years ago when we did some, some, uh, uh, some academic work in um, uh, uh, where we found security vulnerabilities in medical device. And so I spent a lot of time with software radios, picking things out of, uh, out of RF transmissions, you know, finding plain text, uh, looking at different ciphers and what's wrong with them, um, and so on. The connection to privacy for me is that if we do our job well, our healthcare provider customers don't lose data, uh, and you know, they, patients are, are less at risk because of that. Just. Yeah, thank you. My name is Justin Heil. I work with UL Underwriter Laboratories, and I'm in charge of business development and st strategies. Uh, spend, I spend a lot of my time uh, working with not only our manufacturers, but also with uh, hospitals. So I work in the healthcare division, and a lot of the challenges that they're having in the healthcare space um, really resonate with what we have in uh, just the general products. Uh, my background is about 20 years in regulatory and compliance with medical. Uh, I've also spent five years working with medical manufacturers. I've only been in the cybersecurity side about a year uh, working with our group, but what I've really focused on is trying to, do, like I said before, is voice customer, finding out what we need, how we need to develop our program, and how we can elevate products coming to market to have a good cybersecurity hygiene. And Stacy? Uh, hi, everybody. <clears throat> this is honor. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a policy attorney in Washington, D.C. I work for the Future of Privacy Forum. So when they asked me to talk about the future of privacy, obviously, yes. We are a think tank slash policy shop uh, in, in Washington, D.C., committed to responsible data practices. So what that means in English is that I work a great deal with the chief privacy officers and technologists of 150 plus companies that are doing interesting things with personal data. And I try to help bridge the gap between the business realities of that data collection and the increasingly urgent issues of privacy, civil liberties, digital rights, ethics, fairness, and everything that we're going to talk about on this panel. So really looking forward to it. Cool. And, and this is a panel about privacy, so the mics are always on, just so you know. Um, Kim, like uh, the first question is for you. How has the public's view of privacy changed, let's just say, in the age of the Internet? So from 1990 to, to today, how has the public's view of what privacy is 
evolved? Well, I, so I thought you were going to ask me the question that you told me you were going to ask me, which was, <laughs> uh, what did privacy look like 50 years ago, and what did it look like 20 sure. years ago and, and today? Um, 50 years ago, I don't know if you all remember um, Operation Shamrock. Does anyone recall that? That was a government spying operation that involved uh, the NSA, or the precursor of the NSA, obtaining copies of every telegraph message going in and outside of the US. Basically, uh, Western Union basically just handed this over without any kind of authority. And that continued from 1945 to 1975 until it was discovered. And that's when we had the church commission uh, meetings uh, to look into this. And the result of that was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which you guys are probably very familiar with now which oversees what kind of spying uh, the NSA can do overseas and what can be done internally, domestically with data that Google and uh, Microsoft and um, Yahoo and Facebook, these companies, collect on you. So that's what we were looking at in 1975, right? Uh, we were looking at sort of the first real scandal of widespread government surveillance. If we go now to 2000, if we come forward, that's when e-commerce started taking off. And that's where we start to see the first signs of, you know, the things like the double-click scandal, where the advertisers were tracking you online, collecting data about you and selling it. Um, and then also the e-commerce uh, just tracking your purchases and things like that. So really around 2000, we started to become more aware of that. And I, I brought in this issue of PC World Magazine, because this was an issue that I edited. And it was all on privacy. Uh, so going all the way back to the year 2000, this is what we were focused on, was the double-click stuff. Uh, there was a real network scandal. Um, a lot of companies sort of uh, trying to slip things into their code uh, whereby they were tracking you. Um, but it wasn't uh, really, it was in the public's uh, mind, it was in the attention, uh, but the, the public really wasn't fully on board with this. We had pockets of people who were activists, pockets of people who cared about it, but the vast majority of the public uh, wasn't all that concerned about it. And if, uh, can I read up just a paragraph from the beginning of this story? Because this is sort of an interesting about the contrast of what we were looking back in 2000 and we're, what we're looking at now. So just I'm going to read you a couple sentences here. In the real world, nobody knows what TV commercials you watch or which sitcoms you surf. When you go strolling through the mall, no one's making note of the stores you visit or the clothes you try on. But on the internet, websites are doing all of this and more, and that makes some people as mad as hell. So we know now that that's no longer the case. We know that they're tracking you online and they're tracking you offline in the stores. They're tracking you on your television, everything that you're watching. Um, so it's really become all pervasive. And uh, with the, you know, the advancement of data mining, um, there's been a call for more data and more tracking. So I think that the public has become more aware of it now, um, and there's still a large segment of the public that just doesn't care. They're still willing to do that trade-off. So, but they are more aware. Thank you. Um, ben, uh, you know, doctors used to know um, my age, my weight, maybe if I've had an embarrassing disease, you know, not very many things about me. Um, now they know mm, everything, you know, uh, up to and including my genome. Um, what, what does that mean for privacy and, and, and who owns that? Yeah, the question of data ownership uh, in healthcare is really tricky. Um, and so I, I think, uh, think Stacy may be able to tell us a, a good bit about, maybe she doesn't want to talk about HIPAA too much because there's a lot of it, but um, uh, she may be she may be able to talk to some of the sort of genomic aspects and uh, you know who owns what. But I think that um, uh, I, I have sort of two minds about about privacy and and uh, and, and health data. Um, so I'm optimistic in one sense. So um, I think that we have uh, we should be thankful in the U.S. Uh, for the very good regulations that we have. I think HIPAA, for example, is a good common sense regulation. Um, it, there's, it's big, it's hard to read, but uh, it also has a lot of good stuff in there that I think is really well thought out. Um, and some of the, modifica the modifications to HIPAA, such as the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the omnibus um, stuff that got added in 2013, um, very good. So there are pretty good controls over, you know, what healthcare providers are allowed to do with data, uh, under what conditions they're allowed to sell it or not, and so on. Um, 
On the other hand, there's a, a, bit, a pessimistic part of me that often wins out that is, uh, that tells me that we're not really getting all that smarter, sort of like as, a, as consumers as, and as people who use technology, we're not getting all that smarter relative to the things that are trying to trick us, if that makes sense. Because uh, people are building more complicated things that do a lot of tracking that we don't know about. You know, you look at like uh, the Equifax breach and all the things that came out. Holy crap, I didn't know that the, half of those things were being collected. Uh, data brokers like Elsevier, uh, they're all over the place. Companies you've never heard of have tons of data about you. Um, and so, uh, I, I guess a counterpoint to the, 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 the good stuff that's happening among healthcare providers is that um, among healthcare manufacturers, there are very few rules uh, about, what to, about what to do with user privacy. Um, and it's just a lot less regulated. And I, I worry that as, as more things become sort of healthcare related, you know, apps on the phone, et cetera, um, we're going to run into a lot more of these gray areas. Uh, and on, uh, I, I, yeah, that's a pretty good summary of how I feel okay. about it. It's really, there's no clear answer. I'm hopeful, though. It wouldn't be fun if there was. Um, so, Justin, uh, I imagine there's some unintended consequences of the various technologies that we're all bringing into our homes. Uh, you know, we buy stuff to do one thing, but it turns out it does five things. Uh, I didn't really want those other four things, but now I have them. Can you give me some examples of this? Can you talk about this for a bit? Yes. Um, I mean, you think of some of the home assistants that we have. And what, uh, what you mentioned, too, is about the consumer's education of the information they're gathering. Um, sometimes you're gathering so much information just to be able to process a phrase, a keyword, to be able to react on something. But they're mining all that data, all that information, all that context, and they're, with the AI that they're trying to develop, is be smarter, more intelligent, but they have to capture so much information. Do they really need all that information? You think of the um, uh, temperatures um, thermometer for the children um, that just, that they had uh, disclosed on, that was hacked. Do they really need Facebook? right connected to those apps and those are a lot of the things that we see with companies that are coming to us that they just have they're trying to have gather so much information have so much interconnectivity that they're creating so much risk as well um, the other things that we've seen too is that um, th there's there's a, um, a, a system that we looked at that looked at elderly right in the home so a lot of this is home care, going to consumer, outside of the medical market, to look at falls, right? They had an IR, they have CCD cameras, and when you look at their risk assessments, how they looked at the product, how they looked at threats, vulnerabilities, they were saying we're only gathering um, IR data and we're using the CCDs for positioning. Well, when you really looked at it, they were still gathering all the other video information from the CCDs. They didn't deactivate it or do, um, do some sort of encryption or what have you. So now all that information is available to somebody that could compromise that system. So I think we really need to look at how much data are we gathering, what do we really need to gather, and how are we protecting that data? Mm -hmm. I think that's a big, um, kind of a big miss in some of the startups that are coming out. They just don't even consider some of those things and some of those ramifications. Okay. So, so, so Stacy, that was sort of, um, you know, technologies in the home. What about the big picture of IoT, you know, Internet of Things versus consumer privacy? Where, where do you see that either going or intersecting? Well, the interesting, the interesting thing about IoT or the Internet of Things well, a couple interesting things. One, it means different things to different people, right? So in my profession, we're usually talking about IoT that collects some kind of data that is personal, right? Not sensors on a jet engine or on a factory floor, right? Also very useful. Um, but IoT is different, one, uh, because of the ubiquity of the data collection. Um, we're now talking about data collection inside homes having uh, on our bodies, in our bodies, genetic data. And the other um, is that frequently this data does not only implicate us. So this calls into question a lot of the very traditional frameworks 
that United States law has always depended on, uh, specifically the ability of even very well-informed users to make educated decisions about their privacy. Um, a really good example of that is genetic data, for example. So um, a lot of direct-to-consumer genetic testing services today rely on data. Uh, they are services that people want. Um, personally, I, I sent my DNA off to 23andMe back in 2013 because I wanted to know where do my ancestors come from? What health risks am I susceptible to? All of this requires data and are things that are useful and beneficial for society. But your genetic data doesn't only implicate you, right? It implicates your family. Uh, just earlier this year, we saw in California, there was an arrest of a 72-year-old man living in the suburbs who was determined to be the Golden State Killer responsible for over 12 murders in the 1970s and 80s, based not on his genetic data, but on the genetic data of his family members. Uh, so when we talk about things like DNA or we talk about offline tracking like Kim alluded to, we're talking about things that have broader social effects than just the effects on the individual. Um, so we're seeing a lot of movement in that area. Companies are very interested in self-regulation, for example, and I can talk about that. Um, where, 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 yeah, sure. Uh, I, I, I think actually that's a really good point. Uh, you know, when I think we used to be worried mostly about the privacy of uh, the effect on ourselves, and the DNA sample is a really good one, and I'm sure that there are a lot of others where the collection of your data actually has some effect on the people around you. Um, and so it's no longer, it, it's like a communicable disease now, right? Your data can be used against someone else um, or in some kind of method uh, against them. So. Right. Um, can, I, can I add to that? Uh, yes, please. So, so we, we talk about you know your data being used uh, to uh, to either implicate other people or to you know somehow affect things that are, that happen to a population of folks. Like I think in healthcare, there's a uh, there's a good amount of um, uh, hand wringing about you know how to keep patient data private. Um, and there's a really big question around ownership of patient data, and it actually varies state by state. So like New Hampshire is the only state that, that says categorically, you are the owner of your patient data. Um, but there are some really interesting questions that come into play uh, along the lines of what Kim was talking about relative to population health. So uh, if I choose, if I own my data and I choose to conceal something about myself that would have some effect on the population around me, let's say it's a sexually transmitted disease or something, um, and my hiding that has an effect on the people around me. That can be bad news, and I think that we, uh, it's, it's useful to think about that sort of thing here. Yeah, I mean, absolutely the question for all of us is how do we enable these beneficial uses of data, uh, including to combat things like discrimination or solve public health problems while respecting individual autonomy and privacy. It's a very challenging question. And we've seen different legal regimes coming, uh, coming up in the last five years uh, to address these issues. The United States is taking a bit of a different course than the European Union, for example, with the General Data Protection Regulation. And filling in the gaps in the United States, we see a lot of efforts uh, from companies to self-regulate. Is, is there any challenge to, uh, and by which I mean, is someone challenging, um, I don't know how to formulate the question. So. I click through on something to use some app on the iPhone, it now knows something about me which is going to be used against someone else. Can I sign away somebody else's privacy rights? I mean, is that a thing? I mean, it's the, nat <laughs> it's the nature of data that uh, there's not only one copy of it, right? I mean, we saw this with the controversies around Facebook and people allowing access to a third party API to collect things like their friend's information. And so in these kinds of challenges, we are increasingly seeing platforms stepping up and uh, being more influential on the privacy questions, honestly, even in many cases than the mm -hmm. law. It, it's, the it's the platforms and the kinds of restrictions that the platforms choose to implement around the, for example, the iOS operating system, the Android operating system, platforms and social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, these all take very different approaches to 
what they will or won't allow their users to do. Right. Okay. Sammy, did you just suggest that you might read a privacy policy if that were written into uh, one? I, I suggested that I might, yes. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes you forget to bring your phone to the restroom. Um, Kim, you talked earlier about how privacy has changed over time. Um, how has educating the public about privacy changed over time? What, what works? Is anything working today? I think storytelling works. I think that uh, you know, when you're talking about privacy, it can become very abstract. And when you're talking about uh, the massive data sets that people are collecting about you, um, I think that's when people, their eyes glaze over and they don't really see uh, the immediate effects on them. So I think storytelling um, and anecdotes help to really uh, illustrate for people how they personally can be affected. I don't know if you all remember the story about the girl who was shopping for a pregnancy test in Target, and, uh, and then her father gets something in the mail or something gets mailed to the house about pregnancy, and then he knows that his daughter, he makes that connection. So I think that um, those kinds of stories that really illustrate very specific examples and, and even better examples that you just never really thought about. Like the, the 23andMe example of the DNA stuff. I think most people who submitted their DNA to 23andMe was not thinking that it could be used to implicate in a, a criminal investigation a relative. Um, some people wouldn't mind if your relative is guilty of something. But I think that there's um, storytelling ha helps to enlighten the public about things that they haven't thought about, and also new ways of data being used. And so I think that that's really effective. You know, and just to be very clear about the Golden State Killer example, this was not a, a traditional genetic testing service. It was a public database that law enforcement was accessing, uh, you know, the same way that anyone could access. Um, I think where... where without, a, without a warrant. With, without a warrant, right. And so I think where companies like 23andMe and Ancestry have landed is uh, that a warrant is the appropriate requirement. Law, due process is the appropriate requirement. So Future Privacy Forum actually just released a set of best practices that we created um, in collaboration with these major genetic testing companies. And one of the requirements is, is that they are going to publish, for example, the number of law enforcement access requests that they receive each year. Because, yeah, it is, it's an ongoing challenge to figure out what people expect when they sign up for things like this. You know, you, you mentioned that the other day when we spoke. And so I, I searched for that. And the hit before that hit was actually one of those agencies uh, or one of those companies selling the data to a big healthcare organization. So it's just very interesting that, you know, organizations get together to self-regulate Organizations sell their data to, you know, big healthcare. So self-regulation really works when there is reputational pressure from the media, from consumers, when there is a brand, and it really works when there is a threat of regulation because companies would much prefer to have reasonable requirements that are able to adapt over time than a law that, I mean, consider the current Congress, for example, that may or may not solve the problems it was intended to solve. Um, another a l not well understood fact, I think, about self-regulation is that when it's done right, it becomes an enforceable legal document that can be enforced by the Federal Trade Commission and by state attorneys general. Um, public principles, things that are not legally binding self-regulation don't always have that same effect but real public commitments by companies do become legally binding if they're done right. So it, it can have an effect, not the cure-all for everything, but important step forward for this. Okay. That's an interesting point. I, did, I didn't know that it actually could be and uh, have a, yeah. Uh, so I, I was gonna touch on sort of a, a, a case where we've seen self-regulation that was implemented in order to forestall government regulation and it's been a disaster. And that's where we have PCI compliance, right? So we had the uh, bank card industry decided that the, the government was looking at regulating security of credit card data, and they decided that they would impose this themselves 
on companies that do e-commerce with their cards, but it's turned into a real racket and it really hasn't resulted in any uh, sound security. So I think that there's, um, there's a real problem with not sort of revisiting these things when an industry uh, uh, sort of implements, says, hey, hey, well, don't, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. And then the government kind of lets them do that um, and doesn't really revisit the issue and look at, well, this actually isn't working, so. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. Yeah. So, uh, Justin, I'd like to come back over here for a moment. Um, you talked about uh, some, some devices and some other things. Um, let's bring machine learning and, and AI into the picture. You know, um, doctors want to help patients. More data helps more patients. More data is sitting around somewhere for someone to steal or misuse. What's, what, what the heck? What's going on? Well, th that, that is one of the um, big things with the FDA right now is how are they going to regulate or manage that? And that's part of the FDA pre-cert program, which deals with software, more the cloud-based um, AI type platforms or software programs that aren't traditionally regulated as products. I mean, they typically see products coming in the door, right? It sits on a shelf, it does something, it performs some therapy, and now they have software that is helping with clinical diagnosis and what have you. I mean, that, that is the big challenge in the industry and how are they going to regulate that? And they're saying, well, this is not traditional and we can't regulate it like we used to. So what are these key performance indicators, right? How, how do we measure or judge a company that is doing these type of things, having these type of uh, software, these AI that helps patients benefit? And that is an up and coming process right now. And if you look at some of the major companies that are involved with this program, uh, I think there's nine or 10 on it. A lot of them are some of the companies that were resisting regulation, right? And part of that resistance now has driven a new type of regulatory, um, I would say it's, it's not a policy yet, but it's more of a way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. So, and then the other thing too is when you look at patient data, one of the hard things is on where companies fall into risk is, is it de-identified, right, that you can link it to something? as a some sort of code it's not to that patient and for that patient exactly to the patient health record how do you use it is it related directly to a patient name right social security number or is it just completely de-identified that it's just data right not associated with a patient just with demographics of age conditions how they're um, evolving through a therapy and that's kind of how those companies are trying to deal with those three different areas and what is the risk associated with that yeah. and what are the legal responsibilities for those companies in each of those areas, in each of those categories. Ben? So, so from a kind of a deep tech perspective, like uh, de-identifying things is way harder than anybody thinks it is, you know? There are a few people in the world who are experts at really taking identifiers off of things so that a smart person couldn't you know, reapply the identifiers that were that were removed. But it's just like, it, when you start to talk about ML and AI, and, and then you start to think about things like GDPR and the right to be forgotten, um, I, I think that gets, that, that that's where, to me, things like GDPR fall a little short. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do I, how do I teach a model to forget something that it thought it knew, you know? Am I gonna go back and adjust like about, you know, adjust all the weights on the little sigmoids so that it now, you know, it now thinks something else about me? What if I, what if I, who am asking to be removed, was, you know, the one piece of data that tipped some, you know, class into another thing? And, you know, what if all of a sudden it works differently because a key piece of data was removed? Mm -hmm. um, that really, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's, that some of the regulations are not quite as, uh, they're pretty optimistic about the ability to do things like de-identify data mm -hmm. and forget stuff, because that's really hard. Well, so, so let me ask you a follow-up question. And for all of you, actually, you know, in, in security, we sort of have this concept of white lists and black lists. These are the things we allow. These are white lists. These are the things we disallow. This is a black list. So sometimes we do it right. Sometimes we do it wrong. We allow this, we disallow everything else, or we disallow this, we allow everything else. So right now with PII, it sort of seems like we've identified these seven things or nine things or 12 things, depending where you live, that are PII. And everything else is 
up for grabs. So how do we start to work in all these other things? You know, uh, people have identified other people by the way they type on keyboards, by their heart rate, by their respiration, by their, um, the thing you see with a FLIR gun, your heat signature, you know, all these other things. Who, who's gonna turn that into PII? Who, whose job is that? So we were talking about this just before the panel, uh, Ben. The, so the challenge of real solid de-identification is in part that the goalpost is always shifting a little bit, the way that you described, Sammy. So it requires trained experts in de-identification and it requires sort of a, a constant vigilance and uh, in many ways pretending to be a bad actor to figure out if data can be re-identified. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I, so I would add to that. The fun thing about machine learning is that often you don't know what you're learning necessarily, right? So you might be overfitting to some feature that's actually not what you intended to. I mean, this is the, the kind of thing that makes uh, you know, machine learning on network traffic uh, to detect malicious behavior uh, really hard. You know, sure. Often, you, you know, if, without a super uh, great pile of feature engineering uh, done really carefully and you know, tested very, very thoroughly, uh, it's, it's really hard to actually do that right. And, and it turns out if you expose your ML to the internet, it's very easy to teach it to swear and be racist, as Microsoft discovered. Um, so, okay, so let's put all that together. Do we have a privacy problem or do we have an ethics problem? What's, what's the real problem? Is capitalism the problem? What's, what's, what's the real problem? I think it's neither. <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, if you ask uh, about people like what is privacy or what are the ethics to them, you're going to get a different answer because we all don't think about the same thing. You can submit your data to 23andMe and not consider it a privacy violation, let's say, if they hand that off to an insurer to sequence your genome because you've already done it yourself, let's say, and you already know that you don't have any diseases. So it wouldn't be a privacy thing. You're, you're like, oh, I don't care. But let's say I haven't done that, and I, it's a mystery for me what diseases I might have markers for. That's going to be a privacy violation for me. So I think that there isn't one definition of privacy for everyone, and the issue of whether it's privacy or ethics, I think is sort of um, the wrong question. I think that the issue here is we have a data control problem and a transparency problem. So I think that the, the real issue here is who controls the data? Do I control it or you do control it? Do you control it? And then the other side of that is once you have the data, are you transparent about how you're using it so that I can know if you're misusing it according to the controls I've given you? And I think that's the problem because we can have an exchange of data. Um, the question is, you know, when you, when you give data to a company right now and you uh, read the terms of service, if you read the terms of service, that terms of service uh, can change willy-nilly. It's arbitrary. You agree to at the point that you engage in a business or you, or you initiate the business with them. At any time, though, that contract becomes a one-sided contract, and they can, they can alter it. We don't have that in contracts. We don't have that, right? You can't do that. But in this world, we allow that to happen. And so I think that there needs to be some kind of establishment that if you agree with the customer from the beginning about what they do with the data, you can't change that. You can't alter that after. Mm -hmm. And you have to be transparent so that someone can actually determine whether or not you've adhered to that. OK. Anyone else? That's such a good answer. <laughs> um, I, I think 100 years ago, privacy meant secrecy. And that's just not tenable anymore. So even just the very concept of privacy is maybe not what we're going to be talking about in five to 10 years, we're gonna be talking about fairness and data minimization and data control and all of these other sort of related issues. Oh, that, that is interesting. Okay, Ben? So I'm, so I'm fairly hopeful actually because, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd and I think that one thing that my fellow nerds can do to, to fight back against things that we see as, as bad for privacy is choose what to work on. You know, it's the 21st century. We nerds have far more power than we ever had before. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it doesn't mean like don't go work for Google. There's a lot of people there who are doing really good stuff. Um, but I think that we need to use our opinions and our, and our, our expertise 
uh, a lot more than we do. And we can't, we can't just sit on the sidelines while the organizations that we work for uh, are making decisions that are bad for privacy. Mm -hmm. You know, we have intuition, we have good gut feelings about what's good for privacy and what isn't. I think we need to use them. Okay. Justin? It's almost like a yin and a yang, right? Regulation stifles innovation. However, commercial kind of business decisions sometimes supersede ethics. And you need to have a balance between the two, I believe. Okay. So, go ahead. Well, I mean, I just feel like I should uh, plug the fact that MIT and Berkeley and Princeton uh, now have fully-fledged graduate programs and centers for privacy technology researchers that didn't exist 20 years ago, and they're doing just absolutely tremendous work. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, there are places for you. And I can tell you from Washington, D.C., that the results of that kind of academic research are really informing and driving policy. Mm -hmm. um, I should also shout out to Consumer Reports. I mean, just, just in the last five, 10 years, we've seen so much emerge to sort of uh, swing the pendulum the other way and bring in privacy enhancing technologies. Consumer Reports has traditionally been focused on consumer education around home devices. Today, almost all of those home devices are connected to the internet. And so starting last year, Consumer Reports began evaluating home electronics on the basis of uh, what they're calling the digital standard, which is a combination of privacy and security metrics that was developed with privacy advocates. They just released their first set of rankings it's very exciting. That, and that is thanks to two people in the security community, Mudge Zatko and his wife, Sarah, who started sort of the underwriter's lab for examining software. And they worked with Consumer Reports to give them uh, some kind of testing mechanism to examine that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what you said and what you said about the, the technology community uh, really being able to push forward uh, action and policy is really true. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're running out of time, but I, I want to finish up with something you started. Um, what are we going to be talking about in 10 years? Maybe we won't use the word privacy. Maybe it's a new word. Maybe it's a new concept. You know, um, our kids are growing up, and they're pissed because we put their entire lives online. Um, you know, they have no privacy anymore. We know everything about them. You know, they're going to run for Congress and, you know, gee, what about this picture, Senator? Um, so what are we going to be talking about in 10 years? You, you mentioned fairness. I like that word, too. You mentioned transparency. I like that. What do you think? Maybe, maybe we'll have something like what we had with the NRA, you know? Maybe the generation that's coming up is really going to surprise us and there's going to be some kind of major disaster around privacy. And those teens who don't seem to care actually about privacy might surprise us and rise up and cause some change. I don't know. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. Well, so as an older millennial, um, it, it, it's very common to talk about how the young people today do not care about privacy. And I'm not convinced that it's totally true. Uh, first of all, as we have more generations raising children with technology, we're gonna see an increased focus on some of the things that you're talking about, like digital permanence. Uh, what does it mean to not any longer be able to go away to college and leave your old identity behind the way that all of us up here were able to do, presumably at some point? Uh, what does it mean to not be able to play and experiment and uh, try on new identities and go to protests and be politically active in a world where everything is permanent? Uh, but I'm not convinced that young people actually don't care about privacy. Um, I think we may still have yet to come some things in the future. But also, even just today, young people are the ones using privacy-enhancing technologies. Young people are installing ad blockers. Young people are using the Brave browser and uh, searching for things on DuckDuckGo. And WhatsApp. They want WhatsApp because it's got security in it. The, the whole driving force behind WhatsApp is the ephemerality of data. So, I, I mean, as we continue to see this to grow and as more generations raise children, I think 
the technology will emerge to meet the needs of a society that demands it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think that embarrassment is one of the few levers I can still uh, pull on, on my kids. So I, I still have that bit of leverage on them. Um, I, I agree with everything that Kim and Stacy said. Um, I think that uh, privacy to me has always felt like something that's sort of relative. You know, I mean, the, the, the set of people who are making money off of the rest of us uh, is going to keep getting bigger. Uh, and my, my hope is that, you know, we're collectively going to put enough pressure on the people who are doing those things to make sure that you can turn the knob all the way down and so that you can kind of have enough privacy relative to the other folks in your cohort where at least maybe you're less useful to somebody's model uh, training. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, if I look at it as from more of an ecosystem perspective on products, and there's always a weak link in the chain. And let's say we do authorize certain companies to have our data. Um, or hospitals, or uh, you know, manufacturers of healthcare devices. I think with the um, what what I've seen in a NHISAC conference, uh, actually pre presented by Synopsys, is they were talking about companies. 50% of the companies should adopt the NIST framework by I think 2020. That's kind of elevating the whole ecosystem. Everybody that's putting products, software systems on the market with respect to cybersecurity controls. It's really the industry that needs to rise. Okay. And if there's a weak link, they'll find a way to get through and get your data. Okay. I lied. W one more question. So, technology. Technology and privacy. Technology has undermined our privacy. Um, is technology the way we're going to keep our privacy? So let's just pick cryptography as a sample technology. Is cryptography the answer to privacy, or is, is the social component of it, especially the greed component, always going to overwhelm the technological component? I think, I think that's a strong yes. To me, the social component is always good. I mean, we can come up with crypto and all sorts of other things, um, but the, the, the big driver for what actually is getting implemented and, and used often is this sort of, you know, commerce-based, uh, what can we get people to do, uh, well, you know, what, what can we get them to use? Uh, so to me, the, the big drivers for, for change are always, you know, what can, what can we, what, how can we fight back as, as users, you know, like uh, against, the, against this sort of wave of commerce that, that mm -hmm. wants to eat all of us? Mm -hmm. Dustin, yes or no? Technology is going to save us? right after it buries us? There's always unintended consequences <laughs> of everything. <laughs> okay. Kim? I, I think t technology plays a role, but it's not the, uh, the only solution, and it can't be the only solution. Uh, technology only goes so far to protect us. Uh, companies have to make decisions about technology, and Apple happened to make some pro-privacy decisions about their technology. Other companies decide not to make those decisions. So I think that it is a combination of technological solutions, um, outside pressure from the public, and, uh, and legislators. Okay. Stacy. I think technology will save us. And I, I don't want to discount the long way that technology and, and data go towards solving problems of discrimination. Um, for example, using data, you can identify disparate educational outcomes as a result of disparate application of discipline. You can identify racial disparities in the criminal justice system. There's a tremendous amount we can do with technology and data to build better societies, better worlds, and, and improvements for individual lives. Um, technology will save us. I also do not want to discount, though, as a lawyer, uh, the, role, uh, the role of law and policy. It's extremely important, particularly when we're talking about companies that don't necessarily have a reputational calculus to accommodate or don't necessarily have a relationship with individual consumers. Uh, companies like data brokers, companies like people search companies or large online advertising platforms. Um, these companies also have their role and can also bring benefits, but uh, they just don't have the same calculation that other companies do. And so in these contexts, um, there's really no replacement for common sense baseline legislation, which we are slowly 
getting to in the United States. Well, the other thing we talked about too was the employees, right? The moral compass, the ethics of those employees, and that really will seed and, and drive where that company's going. Thank you all very much. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, we have seen a couple of examples of that where the internal employees have, have uh, expressed being fed up with certain policies inside. But I, but I don't think that they can act alone. I think that it is really outside pressure from the public that, it de that decides that enough is enough, and that emboldens employees inside. I don't think that a single engineer can uh, affect change, but I think that working in concert with the public uh, the public decides that there's uh, a baseline, that there's a, a line that a company has crossed, and then engineers inside the company uh, can have much more of an effect. So it's all working in concert. So speak up. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank for having most us. of you Thank as you well. So much. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, panel. We appreciate your help. Just a couple of quick reminders. We're, we're, the party will continue on until 10 o'clock tonight. We appreciate everyone coming. Continue to have a great time. We remind you that we have our synopsis booth. It's booth 128. Remember to bring your scratcher card to get your second free prize tomorrow. And not only that, come by and see our, our IAS tool, Seeker, and get some good demonstrations of all of our tools. And finally, a reminder that Ofer Mayor is going to be giving a presentation on integrating IaaS into your CI/CD platform Thursday from 1.20 to 2.10 at Oceanside G. Thank you very much.